Good evening. My name is Hugo Cardell um, from Fundsmith, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm speaking from London, um, and today I'm going to uh, present um, an update on the Fundsmith Equity Fund and also provide a quick uh, refresher um, on the investment philosophy and investment strategy. Uh, this is a disclaimer, uh, which I you know, recommend you read. Um, just to give you a quick update on the performance of the fund. Um, so this is for our UK vehicle in Stirling. Um, so last year in 2020, you can see the fund uh, delivered a return of 18.3% uh, versus uh, the comparison index we used, the MSCI World, which delivered a return of 12.3%. Um, I think it was quite a, a classic year in terms of performance. Um, as you see on the right-hand side there, the annualized uh, performance since inception is just under 18%. Um, so quite a classic year in terms of you know, historic performance, but I think you know, in, in, in relation to what actually happened um, in 2020, um, you know, we, we were obviously very pleased indeed with the performance that, that the fund uh, delivered. Um, I think if, if you uh, were told in December 2019 um, that in 2020 there would be a you know, global pandemic where you know, large parts of the world were shut down entirely um, and there were you know, quite steep falls in GDP in some of the world's you know, major economies and you're asked to predict what was going to happen to stock markets. Um, I don't think you know, anyone would have predicted um, that stock markets would have performed in, in the way that they did in 2020. Um, but you know, the great luxury that we have at Fundsmith is that we you know, try and, you know, we do not, we have no idea what's going to happen in the market. We you know, spend no time um, trying to predict what's happening um, in you know, the market or, or indeed in um, the macro environment. Um, you know, we are most focused on um, you know, the businesses that we're invested in. Um, in terms of attribution last year, so what worked and what didn't, um, a few of our companies um, actually had quite a good COVID. Um, I won't go th through all of these, um, but just to pick out um, a few from each side. So PayPal was our largest um, contributor in 2020. Um, the you know, trend towards digital payments uh, was obviously accelerated by the pandemic. Um, certainly here in the UK, um, you know, it was very difficult to pay with cash um, from March onwards last year. Um, you know, we really like payments businesses, so PayPal, uh, Visa, MasterCard, we own Visa and PayPal in the portfolio. Um, and the most obvious path to growth for these businesses um, is uh, you know, the, the fall in cash payments. Um, at the start of the pandemic, 85% of transactions uh, were still made using cash, um, and today that's you know, probably closer to, to 70%. IDEX is a, a veterinary testing business. It provides um, equipment to veterinary surgeons around the world. Um, pet, uh, the pet sector had a good COVID. Um, people you know, bought pets. Um, you know, people in lockdown alone uh, wanted company and the company that, uh, that they sought was a pet. Um, if you go and look at, a, uh, look at buying a puppy in the UK, you, know, you can't now, there are very long waiting lists. Um, if you go and try and adopt a, a pet from a cat's or dog's home, you can't, they're empty. Um, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft actually has been in our top five contributors uh, about five or six times since inception 2010, uh, which I think, you know, goes some way to show that, you know, we really like to run our winners. Um, Microsoft obviously benefited from the pandemic in terms of um, you know, an accelerated trend, you know, shift towards cloud computing, um, which, you know, their Azure, Azure product is uh, very well positioned to, to capitalize upon. Just to go through a few of the detractors, I think the two most obvious ones here are Amadeus and Intercontinental. Obviously, with the, you know, shutdown of, of travel, Amadeus and airline uh, reservations and hotel bookings um, obviously had a, a pretty tough time. Um, intercontinental hotels, um, you know, the, the most of the hotels were obviously shut. Now, we, you know, we had quite long conversations with both of these businesses, um, and we were satisfied that they had, you know, strong enough balance sheets to be able to last at least, you know, 18 months or, or two years if they didn't derive a single, uh, you know, pound or cent of, of revenue uh, across that period. But in fact, Intercontinental 
hotels, they break even at about 30% uh, capacity. Um, and indeed, in some parts of the world, um, they started to break even towards the end of last year. Um, I think one quite interesting point to make, certainly about intercontinental hotels, um, and indeed some of the other businesses that didn't do so well, some of our spirits businesses last year, Diageo, for example, um, I think these are businesses which will come out of the pandemic as stronger positions, uh, as stronger businesses with, with stronger market um, positions, essentially, um, because their competitors, you know, the, the smaller boutique uh, hotels or uh, new spirits brands, they will simply have gone bust um, throughout the pandemic. Um, so I think you know, they will emerge from this with um, you know, stronger positions. Now, I always think it's useful uh, just to remind investors uh, what it is that we actually do. So we have a very simple three-step investment process, uh, which is here. So step one, we seek to only invest in good businesses. Step two, we try not to overpay for those businesses. And step three, we do nothing, uh, which is actually the hardest part. Um, you know, we have a very long and detailed definition as to how we define good businesses. Um, which I'll come on to explain. I think that's the most important part, but certainly the most difficult part is do nothing. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we want to own these businesses forever if we can. Um, you know, we really do want to own them for the next 30 or 40 years. Timing is on our side you know, when we own, when owning good businesses. Um, it is a very difficult discipline to adhere to, to just sit there and resist the temptation to fiddle or, or tamper with the portfolio. Um, but it's one that you know, we think we adhere to quite well. So what do we mean by um, a good business? We have, as I say, quite a long and, and detailed definition as, as to how we define good you know, quality, um, which I'll go through um, in a few slides. So the first thing we look for are companies with uh, good operating numbers. Um, so what do we, I mean by that? We're looking for businesses which can consistently generate very high returns on capital, uh, well in excess of their cost of capital, they can produce those returns in cash and without requiring leverage. So we're looking for businesses which can, over long periods of time, um, generate very high returns on capital, well in excess of those, uh, the cost of that capital, um, produce their returns in cash and without requiring leverage. Now, return on capital you know, it's been talked about for a very, very long time. In fact, if you look at what the probably, arguably the world's most famous investor said in his 1979 annual letter to shareholders, he said that the primary test of managerial economic performance is the achievement of a high earnings rate on equity capital employed. He's talking about return on capital here and not the achievement of consistent gains in earnings per share. Now, we think he has been pretty much ignored universally since then. Um, if you go and look at any piece of you know, sell side research, anything from a, a broker or a bank, um, they will lead with earnings per share. Um, something that you know, we and, and indeed Warren um, thinks is a, is a pretty useless metric to look at. Earnings are very easy to manipulate. Um, Terry in the early 90s uh, wrote a book called Accounting for Growth, which basically outlined 12 uh, accounting techniques that a lot of big businesses back then were, were using to, to manipulate their earnings. Earnings are, are not, in our view, a very useful uh, measure uh, to use. So return on capital, that, that, that's you know, what, what we look at. That's our primary test of a, of a, of a good business. Um, there are some businesses uh, that obviously do not generate um, decent returns on capital. Essentially, you know, any business has a cost of capital. We could have a cost of capital if we took out a loan from a bank at a rate of, say, 5%. If we invested that at 7 or 8% and pocketed the difference, we would, be, we would become richer, more valuable. If we invested that at 2 or 3%, you know, we would become poorer, less valuable. Businesses are exactly the same. So on the right-hand side of the, the slide here, um, we have a table showing bad businesses. Um, so we have a, a column showing return on capital, weighted average cost of capital, and then the difference between the two. So these are bad industries. Uh, these are industries which destroy value. We are never going to own any, any business um, in any of these industries. Whereas on the left-hand side, we see uh, good businesses. So these businesses, as you see here, all consistently generate returns well in excess of their cost of capital. Um, these businesses you know, are accreting in value every day that we own them. 
Now, obviously, there are, there are a few thousand businesses in, in this um, table. You know, we only, we've only found 70 businesses in the entire world worth investing in. But nevertheless, these are the sorts of sectors where we have found um, these businesses. Just to give you a couple of other examples. Um, this is actually a slide that we've had in the presentation you know, for, for a very long time now. You may well recognize it. Um, but we think, you know, it, certainly with the events of last year, it's quite interesting to, um, to talk about. So this is the airline industry, uh, which we have always thought is you know, pretty much universally the worst industry in the world. Uh, we are never going to own an airline at, at Fun Smith. So it's a 21 year period. Um, these, these are the IATA statistics, the independent airline body. Um, and it basically shows that the cost of capital, uh, this red line at the top here, was on average about 8% across the period. Whereas the returns they generated um, on that capital, so these gray bars at the bottom, they varied quite a bit, but on average, they're about 3%. So this is an industry taking in capital at a cost of about 8% and reinvesting at a return of 3%, destroying 5%. Um, every single year. And by the way, they had about $500 billion worth of invested capital across this period, um, of which they destroyed 5% of every single year. Yeah, this is a machine for destroying value. Now, look, I'm sure um, you've come across fund managers or investors who like airlines and who've made money out of airlines. But to do that, you've got to be able to time your investment. You've got to basically get in um, around here and get out before the end of 2007, essentially. Now, that is something you know, we can't do. As long-term investors, um, you know, we cannot own a business that looks like that, essentially. Now, this is a good business. Um, Unilever, this is a company we have in the portfolio. But all of our businesses in our investable universe, they all look like this. So Unilever, as you can see here, has consistently generated returns well in excess of their cost of capital. And well in excess is important. Um, you know, it's not a few percentage points above the cost of capital. In some cases, it's, you know, 20 percentage points nearly above their cost of capital. Even at the bottom of the cycle, 2008, 2009, this is a business which is still accreting in value. Um, you know, this is a, a defensive business. So, you know, Unilever is a little bit bigger today than it was yesterday. Um, this is the sort of business we like. So this is a, a look through table. I'm sure those of you familiar with the strategy will recognize this. Um, this is something we produce every year. This is a look through um, in terms of the various operating metrics uh, uh, that we seek in our businesses. So as you can see on the top line there, our returns on capital uh, for the portfolio has have averaged in the high 20s, came down a little bit last year because of the pandemic. Um, but currently our businesses produce a 25% return on capital on average, which is roughly two and a half times that uh, when compared to the indices. And bear in mind, quite a few of the businesses in the portfolio are in the S&P already. Um, so if you take those out, you know, the average would be, would be even lower. Um, so I think we can say with certainty that we, we do own very good businesses, certainly in terms of uh, return on capital. A um, couple of other numbers to, to point to here, gross margins. So we like businesses which are able to generate consistently high gross margins over long periods of time. Um, our companies on average generate about a 60, just over a 60% gross margin. Just to put that into English, our companies make things for four and they sell them for 10. Um, that obviously puts you in a very strong position. The market, on the other hand, on average makes things for about uh, six and they sell them for 10. You have some businesses in the portfolio, L'Oreal in cosmetics, they generate a 70% gross margin. Um, now, the reason why we like high gross margins sustained over long periods of time is because it shows that there is a, you know, there's some sort of barrier to entry. Uh, there's an economic moat. Uh, there is something about your business that is stopping competition from coming in and eroding those very high gross margins. So in the case of, of L'Oreal, it's, it's the brands. Those cosmetic brands are very powerful things. Uh, cash conversion is the only other number I'll point to here. So, you know, we like cash. As I said, we don't look at earnings. Um, you know, earnings are easy to manipulate, whereas you cannot manipulate cash. Um, cash is king, cash pays your bills, uh, your dividends. So we like our companies to convert uh, the majority of their profits into cash, which they do, as, as you see here. So that's, this is the first part of how we define quality. Um, you know, good operating numbers. And you can run quite a simple screen through Bloomberg to pull out companies that have these sorts of characteristics. The second part of how we define quality 
um, is more qualitative. So it's very important how businesses make their money. Um, we are typically seeking businesses which generate uh, their returns out of a large number of everyday, relatively predictable repeat events or transactions. Um, we're not interested in businesses that make their money through a few you know, contracts each year. Uh, we don't like that. We like, like a lot of everyday, uh, relatively predictable events or transactions. Um, it's also very important that you know, business makes its money in a, in a way that we can understand. Um, you know, Terry often says, if he cannot explain to you know, a six-year-old child how a business makes its money in one sentence, um, you know, we're not interested, basically. We also look for uh, structural characteristics within the business, which help protect and defend these very high returns we see on this page from competition. So, you know, brands, uh, we look for distribution networks or supply chains that are very hard to copy or replicate. Um, we look for businesses with installed bases of equipment, so either hardware or, or software. If you have an installed base, you basically have a tame client to which you can sell services, spares, upgrades, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we look for franchises, uh, patents, um, et cetera. So structural characteristics which help uh, protect and sustain these very high returns from competition. And then the final part of, of how we define quality is that it is very important that these businesses can grow. As long-term investors in these businesses, our returns are gonna be dictated by the business's ability to reinvest cash flows back into the business at that 25% return on capital. Over the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years, that's what's gonna dictate our returns. Um, so it's very, very important that these businesses can grow. We're not interested in businesses which you know, have fantastic um, operating numbers um, and you know, they have you know, good uh, sort of structural advantages, but they cannot grow. Um, you know, they just have to pay all the cash out as, as a dividend. We're not interested in that. Um, that's essentially just a, a bond. We are looking for businesses with the ability to, to reinvest. So there have got to be some very obvious paths to growth, um, a few of which are here. So you've all heard our um, toothpaste stat, which is that two thirds of the world don't yet brush their teeth with toothpaste. Um, I think that is a you know, path to growth that you can probably explain to a six year old. Obviously a third of the world already uses toothpaste. So the path to growth, growth there is through pre premiumization, um, trying to persuade consumers to switch up from the regular brand um, to the whitening brand, the whitening platinum plus brand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so very important that these businesses have you know, path to growth. Now, having applied that set of criteria to the 65 odd thousand listed securities in the world, we've basically only found 70 that meet that uh, quality criteria. Um, so we have an investable universe of 70 businesses of which we have 20 to 30 of those businesses um, in the portfolio at any one time. So today we have 29 companies in the portfolio. Uh, you know, we'd love to find more businesses. Um, we look at you know, between five to 10 new businesses each year but most of them just do not meet uh, our quality criteria. So they don't make the cut into the universe. Um, but you know, we're happy with 70. We think you know, 70 is a, a good number to look after. Um, just to give you an idea of the, the sorts of sectors that these businesses are in. Um, so we have two tables here. So on the right hand side is how the MSCI defines the sector. Um, and we actually break it down a little bit further on, on the left hand side. So we don't tend to like the term tech um, or technology. Essentially, we would never want to be investing in a business uh, where we can be blindsided by change. Um, you know, we, we like businesses um, where they are you know, essentially protected in, in some way. Now, technology changes too quickly. You can get taken out overnight you know, with you know, technological change. So the sorts of businesses we have in uh, the tech industry tend to be businesses with you know, legacy installed bases of, of equipment. So you know, these are not the high-end, fast-moving tech businesses, which you know, people usually um, associate with the term tech. But I'll, I'll run through a, a few examples on the left-hand side. Uh, so fast-moving consumer goods, you know, I guess this is a fairly classic Funsmith sector. Um, so these are branded products that we use on a daily basis. 
And once we've used them, we've got to go and buy some more, essentially. So what, you know, once we've used our tube of toothpaste or we've drunk our can of Pepsi and we want to consume more Pepsi or clean our teeth again, we've got to go and buy some more. Um, so yeah, household cleaning products, our snacks, our soft drinks, our cosmetics. We call these products small ticket consumer non-durable. So small ticket, you know, they don't cost very much. It's not a big um, you know, life-changing you know, decision or event. You know, you'd have to go and read up and, and do research as you would when you're buying a house or a, a car or a television. Um, you, know, you get change from a few dollars. Small ticket, consumer, they tend to get sold directly to, to us, the consumer. They don't get sold to some big purchasing manager who comes and beats you up in price and then reneges a few months later. Um, you know, we have no negotiating power when we're buying our you know, can of Pepsi. So small ticket, consumer, non-durable. As I said, once you finish your can of Pepsi and what you want to you know, consume more Pepsi, you've got to go buy some more. We don't like durable products. Cars are a durable product. Um, if you are feeling hard up and your car breaks down, you don't go buy a new car. You get that car serviced. You can prolong the life of, it, of that particular product. We don't like that. Um, so small ticket consumer non-durables. Um, so businesses with install base of software. So as I said, these tend to be legacy uh, software businesses. So Microsoft, for example, 98% of the world's computers run a Microsoft operating system. At some point, you have to upgrade to the latest security or software, and you, know, you write a check to Microsoft for that, essentially. We like businesses which provide accounting and payroll software, uh, ADP, Intuit. ADP pay 20% of the US population. Every single time someone uh, receives a paycheck, ADP take a royalty, essentially. Intuit provide accounting uh, and tax software to small and medium-sized businesses. Um, essentially, once you use that software, it's very highly integrated into each of their customers' businesses. And so it's, yeah, it's quite hard to get rid of. They do quite a good job, so you don't tend to want to get rid of them um, anyway. Medical equipment. So again, this is low tech, uh, low ticket medical equipment and devices. This is not, you know, not pacemakers. You know, we, we don't like sophisticated uh, medical um, equipment. Yeah, we like sharps, needles, catheters, syringes, um, oncology equipment, tubes, uh, replacement hips, limbs. So we're in a business called Beckton Dickinson. Their best-selling product is a packet of 10 uh, lockable disposable syringes. Um, so once the doctors administered the jab, uh, the syringe locks, you know, you've got to chuck it away. Packet of 10 of those for a dollar. Um, we own Striker in replacement uh, hips, limbs. Um, we think this is quite a good play on the aging population. Um, certainly the aging population wanting to remain more active in their later years. People also quite price and sensitive um, you know, when it comes to their own healthcare as well. Payment processes, so as I've discussed at the start, you know, we own Visa and we own PayPal. Um, you know, there's a very obvious path to growth here in that you know, uh, we think cash is in decline, essentially. Um, but Visa and PayPal, sorry, Visa and MasterCard basically have a payments network that is virtually impossible to replicate. That is a huge installed base of equipment. Franchise businesses, obviously, if you're trying to generate a high return on capital, it's quite a good idea not to employ much capital. So the two businesses we have here are Starbucks um, and Intercontinental Hotels. Uh, so just to give you an idea, um, Intercontinental Hotels, they operate about 6,500 hotels around the world, but they only physically own about 10 of those hotels. Um, so that you know, low capital intensity translates into very high returns of capital. They just provide the, the branding and the management of those hotels, essentially. Installed base of hardware. Um, these are elevator and escalator businesses. Essentially, the business model is that they come in, they install the elevator or escalator, and they make their money through the servicing contracts. Uh, so Kone, Otis, Schindler, those are the three main players. We own Kone in the portfolio. Um, technology hasn't changed. I think if Mr. Otis came and had a look at the safety elevator that we had in our building, he would recognize it as the elevator that he patented in the late 1800s. It's essentially a box with a rope and a, and a weight at the other end. We think it is unlikely that we're going to wake up tomorrow and be blindsided by um, some new way of, of moving people up and down the building. Uh, so those are the sorts of businesses that, that we own. I think we're almost more defined by what we don't invest into than what we do invest into. 
So there's a whole you know, list of sectors that you know, we will just never own uh, businesses in, uh, which I'll, I'll run through very quickly. So airlines, you know, we're never going to own an airline for, for reasons explained earlier. Uh, we're never going to own a bank. Um, banks, by definition, uh, require leverage to, to make an adequate return. And at some point in the credit cycle, you know, that is likely to get withdrawn and it all goes horribly wrong. Um, we also think it, you know, the accounting is, is it fairly opaque. Um, yeah, it's very difficult to work out what the true you know, underlying exposures are, certainly with you know, derivative exposures, um, which, by the way, can all be changed at the click of a button. Uh, similarly with insurance businesses, you know, the accounting is just too opaque. Uh, we don't like any other financial services businesses. We don't like anything very heavily cyclical. Um, we don't like any oil or gas or commodity related businesses. The issue with commodity related businesses is that the share price is only really a factor of the underlying commodity price. And we've no idea what that's doing. So it's not something you know, we're, we're going to try and predict. Um, we don't like any uh, construction businesses, no uh, chemicals businesses, um, no property related businesses. We don't like the majority of high end uh, fast moving tech. Um, you know, I think it's unlikely we'll ever own Netflix. Um, we're, you know, we're not particularly keen on Amazon. I mean, the two parts to Amazon's business, uh, the, the retail business doesn't actually make, make any money. The retail business is, is you know, supported by Amazon Web Services. If Amazon Web Services you know, was a standalone business. You know, it's the sort of business that we might like, but as it is, it, it, it's not. Um, we don't like Tesla. Um, you know, we don't like car companies at, at the best of times, you know, durable products. Uh, we don't like any, we don't like the majority of pharmaceutical businesses because there's a very large amount of expenditure on research and development with very little certainty of producing a drug that you know, works or you can get to market at the end of, end of the day. Similar with biotech businesses. We don't like uh, utilities businesses. We don't like uh, retail businesses. The margins are just too low. Uh, we don't like telecoms businesses. Uh, most, most things we don't like. Um, I think you get the picture. But you know, we're happy that there are only a, a small number of sectors where we have found you know, good businesses. So that was step one. That's, you know, I think, probably the most important part. Um, step two, you know, valuation, don't overpay. So we use the free cash flow yield. We don't use the, the, the um, PE ratio. We use the free cash flow yield. Um, so the free cash flow that the company generates divided by its market cap. And so we compare that with um, other companies in the portfolio, uh, the investable universe as a whole, uh, the market, and then uh, the, what the long bond should be yielding. This is the current free cash flow uh, yield of the portfolio. So as at the end of 2020, uh, the portfolio was a free cash flow yield of 2.8%. Um, now, if you compare that with the two indices, uh, so the S&P is probably the most relevant um, indices to compare it with. So we're you know, very roughly about you know, 30% more expensive uh, than the S&P. But it's worth remembering just on this slide here that we're about two and a half times the quality of the S&P, certainly in terms of return on capital. Um, so we think that you know, increased valuation is justified. Uh, we think you know, you know, we're very happy paying up for quality um, because quality persists. Um, so, you know, whilst our business is expensive, we don't think they're, you know, too expensive. Uh, this is just a quick slide to show, you know, how much you can actually pay uh, for these businesses and still, you know, have a very good investment performance. Um, so between uh, January 1973 and September 2019, the MSCI world delivered an annualized return of 6.2%. And so this chart basically shows what you could, what PE you could have paid for these businesses to generate a 7% compound annual growth rate. So 7% beating the, the compound annual growth rate of the MSCI over that period, which compounded at 6.2%. So how much could you have paid? So with uh, L'Oreal, for example, you could have paid a, a PE of 281 um, and delivered a 7% compound annual growth rate across that period. Um, you know, I'm sure you'll recognize you know, many names, brown form we have in the portfolio, PepsiCo. Um, I think if we were sitting here today and I told you that you know, the portfolio was on a, on a PE of you know, 100, for example, I think you'd probably turn the laptop off and you know, go down the pub. Um, 
So I think, you know, this just goes to show, I mean, you know, we're, we're nowhere near that sort of valuation. Um, but I think it just goes to show that you really can pay very expensive looking prices for these sorts of businesses and still generate a, a you know, fantastic return through owning their shares. Um, finally, uh, do nothing. So, you know, as I said, we are loath to, to sell a good business. We really want to own these companies forever. Um, there are a few reasons why, you know, we would sell out of a business. Just to give you an idea of the 29 companies we have in the portfolio today, nine of them were in the portfolio um, in 2010 when the fund was launched. We've lost very roughly uh, one every two years to a takeover, um, um, you know, where we are forced to sell. So you know, we might have slightly more if, if, if those events hadn't, hadn't occurred. Um, but essentially, there are a few reasons why we would uh, sell a business. First of all, obviously, if we get forced to, to sell you know, in the event of a takeover. Um, secondly, you know, for valuation, I think it's unlikely um, that you know, we, we sell for, for valuation reasons, but you know, it's certainly the reason why we would sell a business. Um, if a business starts to become a less good business, either um, you know, through disruption or if management start to uh, misallocate capital, management start to do you know, something stupid, you know, we would uh, sell out of the business. So just to give you some examples as to what did happen in 2020. So 2020 was actually quite an active year, um, as you can see here. Typically, you know, we changed maybe two or, or three positions each year. Um, so 2020 was, was certainly pretty active. But I think you know, we got presented with quite a few opportunities throughout the year, certainly the first half of the year, um, which led to this slightly higher turnover. So you may notice that Clorox um, was actually only purchased in the portfolio in 2019. Now, this has broken a, a Fundsmith uh, record for the shortest ever holding period uh, for, for a position in the portfolio. Now, you know, it's not something we're proud about, um, but Clorox and Reckitt Benckiser, they both had you know, a very good start uh, to the pandemic. Clorox, obviously known for making uh, bleach and household cleaning products. Um, you know, the share price did very well um, in the first a part of this year of 2020, sorry, um, and you know the sort of the increased uh, you know sales that that business that the business was doing, we thought were you know unlikely to be sustained over the next few years. Um, and at the same moment, uh, there are two businesses which we had in our investor universe, Nike and Starbucks, uh, which you know we had coveted for quite some time, but had always traded on valuations that were too rich for us. Um, they both had very steep falls in their in their share prices in you know, mid March, which presented us with an opportunity. So you know, looking at Clark's, which is trading on a reasonably rich valuation and and, you know, and was trading, which we thought was probably not um, going to be sustained over the next um, few years, we thought you know it was quite a sensible switch to sell out of Clark's um, and allocate the proceeds into uh, Nike and Starbucks, which we started doing in in mid March. Um, Nike, obviously, you know, one of the world's largest um, online uh, sportswear uh, businesses and Starbucks, um, you know, we like franchise businesses in coffee. Starbucks also had, you know, uh, quite a, a lucky, I think, start to the pandemic in that their largest competitor in China, Luckin Coffee, uh, was exposed as a fraud. Um, we also, towards the end of the year, bought a position in LVMH. Uh, so we like the luxury uh, sector. We have a little bit of luxury exposure in our cosmetics businesses, um, in uh, L'Oreal and Estee Lauder. Uh, we have a little bit of luxury exposure in our spirits businesses, Brown, Foreman and Diageo. But the one uh, area of luxury we didn't have any exposure to was in the you know, apparel and, and clothing. Um, and I think you know, 2019 certainly demonstrated that LVMH is a you know a very defensive business. Um, you know, had fantastic uh, results last year. Church and Dwight, you know, this is a fairly classic uh, Funsmith consumer staples business. Um, they make arm and hammer toothpaste, they make Trojan condoms, they make first response uh, pregnancy testing um, kits as well. So yeah, that was somewhat a replacement for our uh, Clorks and, and Reckitt Benkiser positions. And at the start of this year, um, we've sold out of um, Intertech. Intertech had been you know, worrying us for, for a little uh, while now. Um, essentially, we, we were worried that they were um, you know, failing to, to you know, retain um, existing customers. Uh, 
Um, so we sold out of Interdector to make some space in the portfolio for you know, any other opportunities that might arise. And that's it. Um, hopefully we haven't gone too far over time. I know we have some questions, some of which have been submitted in advance, um, which I will go through now. Um, so the first one is, do you have any uh, concerns about inflation and are you doing anything to position the fund for this? A um, couple of things to say on this. I think in terms of you know, us positioning the fund, I think the sorts of companies that we're invested in are actually already very well positioned. Um, if you go and look at that uh, look through slide again, you will see here that on average, our companies generate um, you know, a 25% return on capital. Now, you know, look, inflation is in the low single digits, but you know, were that to increase to say 10%, I think you know, we, we'd certainly do a lot better owning businesses which generate a 25% return on capital versus those that you know, generate a 10% return on capital. If you own a 10% return on capital business with 10% inflation, you're not making any money. Um, so I think you know, our portfolio is already very well positioned. The other thing to point out is that our companies obviously generate very high gross margins. Um, you know, they clearly have pricing power and the ability to, to pass on any input uh, cost increases to consumers. Um, you know, people are quite brand loyal with, with these sorts of businesses. So you know, whilst we don't spend any time trying to sort of predict or, or think about you know, macro events, um, you know, because we, you know, they're basically outside of our control. The only thing we can control are, are the sorts of businesses that we're invested in. And I think if you own good businesses, quality businesses, um, you know, they, they will, you know, they're about the best place to be in, in, a, in a high inflationary environment. Second submitted question, uh, do you see any opportunities in cyclical companies that may benefit from a return to relative uh, normality? Now we don't tend, hopefully, you know, you know, you've seen in the presentation, we don't tend to like cyclical businesses. I mean, there's no such thing as a non-cyclical business. Um, there's a de degree of cyclicality to, um, to every business, but the sorts of businesses we own are about the least sorts of, of cyclical businesses. Now, you know, trying to predict, you know, when the uptick in the cycle is going to be, it is, is not our game. Um, you know, we think that is, we think market timing is, is very, very difficult to do. Um, we think that we have this great expression. We think there are two types of market timers, those who can't market time and those who don't know they can't market time. So, you know, we know we can't market time. We know we can't predict, you know, macro events or indeed, um, you know, the, the effect that that macro event will have on the market. So it's just, it, it's, it's, not, it's not something we're going to be involved with. We're always going to remain invested with these, you know, high quality types of businesses. Are you repositioning the portfolio in any way? Are you Brexit political tension with China uh, regulatory? I think just to talk about uh, you know, Brexit to start off with, I think you know, Brexit is basically an irrelevance for, for the portfolio. Um, I mean, you know, about 2% of our company's revenues are derived from the UK. Um, and I think these are very defensive revenue streams as well. So regardless of whether we're inside or outside of the EU, I mean, we still can buy Pepsi in, in the UK. I mean, you know, it does, you know, we can still buy Colgate toothpaste. Um, so, you know, I think Brexit is basically unaffected. Um, I think, again, in, in terms of, you know, repositioning the portfolio, that's just not how we invest. I mean, you know, we, we are trying to buy the best businesses that we can find in the world and just hold them forever. I think... I think if you asked Unilever in 50 years time, um, you know, what the source your success was, you know, assuming they, they had been you know, successful as they have been over the last 50 years and the next 50 years, um, you know, what, what the sort of the recipe to that success was, I suspect the management would point to, you know, the strength of their brand, the, the marketing you know, power, um, their installed bases, their distribution networks or supply chains. Um, they'd probably you know, point to product innovation. They'd probably you know, say management. I think what they wouldn't say is you know, favorable um, sort of regulatory environment or you know, you know, favorable interest rate environment. I don't, you know, I don't think they're going to point to that. So, so I think as long-term investors in quality businesses, it, it's the businesses uh, which is what's most important, um, not the environment that, that they operate in. 
And then the final uh, question, which was submitted in advance, was if the investing environment is changing, can you see the fund being more active in terms of transactions? I think that you know, we, we always aim to have pretty low portfolio turnover. I think you know, last year was quite a good example. You know, when we get presented with opportunities, when we get presented with um, you know, dislocations in, in share prices of, of businesses that you know, we cover it or we'd like to own in the portfolio, Yes, you know, I, I'm sure uh, we will be more active. I think you know, last year was the, was the perfect case. We got presented with you know, several opportunities in the year, and so the fund uh, was more active. Um, but in general, I, you know, I think we're we're always going to try and, and keep portfolio turnover um, to a minimum. Now we have a few other um, questions here. So one from Marco, uh, you said you sell the business only when there are no longer good initial conditions. Uh, what about the opposed? Would you sell a business if you think it's too much overpriced? So would we sell a business for valuation reasons? Um, I, think we, I think we would. So I think Clorox um, is you know, certainly an example of, of a business that was trading on a, a higher valuation relative to you know, businesses in the universe, which we thought were perhaps a, a better um, you know, investment proposition um, over the longer run. But I think in general, um, we, we owned a business called Domino's Pizza in the portfolio, which we sold out of um, in 2016. It, and it had been our you know, best performing uh, stock. It was up over 750%. Um, but it was trading very expensively. It was trading on a free cash flow yield of you know, close to 2%. Um, and so, you know, we, we could not justify um, holding dominoes at, at that valuation in the portfolio. Now, funnily enough, if, if Terry, Terry said that if he um, ran the portfolio as a family office, he wouldn't have sold dominoes. He'd have, he'd have held on to dominoes. But because we are an open-ended daily dealing fund, we have to, you know, we feel obliged um, to offer decent value on any any given day for, for new investors or you know, existing investors topping up their position. And so we could not justify holding a, a Domino's at that valuation. But what happened was um, Domino's in the, you know, the next few years doubled again. So you know, we shouldn't have sold Domino's. You know, we were wrong to do that. So I think you know, we, we have had our, our, we call it our BD and AD moment, our before Domino's and after Domino's moment. Um, I think you know, we are much more unlikely to sell out of businesses on valuation grounds. I mean, just to give you another example, IDEX, uh, which is at your you know, third largest position in the portfolio. Um, we have not bought a single new share in IDEX since 2016. Um, we really want to, you know, we're running that winner essentially. Now, you know, if we sold out of IDEX, we not, we'd never be able to get back in. Um, we just want to own that business forever. Um, so I think you know we would sell for valuation grounds, but I think it's it's you know it's unlikely. Um, second question here: only growth or growth at reasonable valuation? Which one would makes more sense? So we never really like to sort of compartmentalize our investment um, strategy. Um, yeah, you know, some people would say it was growth, some people would say it was value. I yeah, you know, I think we'd say it was a bit of both. Um, Obviously, you, know, you need the growth aspect and you know, valuation is, is obviously important. Um, I think we would say quality growth at a reasonable price um, is quite a good way of explaining our, um, our process. And then the final question, um, what did you buy instead of Intertech or is the money in cash? So um, there might be a new position, which I'm uh, unable to disclose, um, but typically, um, you know, we might see other uh, advantages to just deploying that cash back into the portfolio. Um, you know, there are some stocks in the portfolio that have come off quite a lot so far this year. Um, and so, you know, Terry's a very active buyer of, of dips, essentially. Um, so it'll be a bit of both. Let's just check to see if there are any other questions. No. Doesn't look like there are. Anything else from the floor? Well, if we're done, 
it looks like it's ten uh, quarter past six on the dot. Um, so there are no further questions. I don't know if Ian or Elena have anything that they want to add. Hi Hugo. Hi there. Hi. Can I can I very quickly ask? Um, there's a lot of talk about value and yeah. the rotation from growth to value happening now. Um, obviously, over the years, quality's always outperformed value. Do you think that's still going to continue, even if value does come back? I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean, people define value sort of very differently. I mean, you know, today, I think people define value as you know, anything that's cheap. Um, and I think you know, there's a reason for a lot of businesses you know, trading cheaply today, which is that, you know, they're just some, simply not very good businesses. So why would you want to, you know, we, we I mean, we, you know, we're always going to come back to this, you know, this great Charlie Munger quote that is much better to buy a wonderful business at a fair price than it is to buy a, a fair business at, at a wonderful price. You know, we're, we are always going to own the better business because over, you know, over the long run, over the next 20 or 30 years, our returns you know, are not going to be dictated by the valuation that we can buy and sell something at. They're going to be dictated by you know, the underlying business's ability to, to reinvest cash flows at, at high rates of return on capital. So you know, I, I am sure there will inevitably be a period where you know, this strategy, you know, it underperforms. There will you know, invariably be a period of, you know, I don't know, a few years perhaps, where um, you know, other strategies will you know, deliver a better performance. Um, but you know, when that is, you know, I have no idea. Um, I think you know, you know, we're very quite keen cyclists at, at Fundsmith, um, and we quite often liken investing uh, to the Tour de France. Um, you know, there are three different types of stage to the Tour de France. It's impossible to win every single stage, but to win the Tour de France, you've got to be very good at, at one stage, and you've got to be okay at the other two. Um, so I think you know, our strategy delivered its best relative uh, performance, actually when, when times are tough, um, because of the defensive nature of the businesses that we're investing in. Now, over the last decade, you know, we haven't really seen much of that. Um, yeah, we've seen a, you know, a very strong, persistent bull market. And you know, in, in raging bull markets, we actually expect to you know, probably slightly underperform or you know, at least keep up with the market. And we have indeed kept up or actually narrowly outperformed the market just because you know, we've always been, been fully invested. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, over the next 20 years, I'm sure there will be periods where this strategy is just less well and perhaps you know, value has its um, time in the sun. Um, but you know, it's, it's, we're, we're always only ever going to be invested in quality businesses. I think, Ian, that's your job to decide whether <laughs> you know, this is the time to switch into value or not or whether to stick with um, the, the good businesses. <laughs> that okay? Any further questions? Well, if everyone's finished, um, I shall stop sharing the screen. And I shall leave if that's okay.